Welcome to the Niche Pursuits Podcast. Are you ready to discover some niche business ideas that actually work? Well, it's time for a motivational kick to jumpstart your next big idea. Here's your host, Spencer Haas. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the Niche Pursuits Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Haas from nichepursuits.com. And I'm happy to say that I've actually got a guest on the show today, somebody that has been importing products for quite a while. Uh, his name is David Bryant from ChineseImporting.com. So David, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me, Spencer. Yep, absolutely. I kind of feel like I, I'm talking a lot about importing products and FBA a lot more, but when I look at guys like you and, and other people that I've interviewed, you're so far ahead of the game when, when you know compared to what I'm doing. You've been doing this for years, and I almost feel like an imposter even talking <laughs> about the little bit of expertise that I have. So um, hopefully you can share some of your knowledge with, with me and with uh, the audience here. So I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, let's give it a shot. Yeah, so... First of all, just to get started, when and why did you get started importing products from China? You know, it's it's kind of a funny story. Um, I've always kind of been an avid traveler, um, backpacker, going to different countries in the world. And so when I was in university, I went over to China for a few weeks uh, just to backpack around, see the Great Wall, um, just kind of to see the sights. But while I was over there, when I first landed in Shanghai, I realized that there is a Shanghai boat show going on. And my family's always kind of been avid boaters, so I had to go to this boat show. And I went over there, and uh, lo and behold, there's tons of different Chinese suppliers over there selling different boating products. And I talked to a few different suppliers, and I hit it off with one um, supplier, and he had this table and chair set that goes on the patio of a boat. And I asked the supplier, I said, hey, do you think you can give me a couple samples of these to take back to Canada and uh, try to sell? And he said, sure, go ahead, no problem. Now, the only problem, though, with these uh, table and chair sets that he gave me was that they weighed about 60 pounds and they measured about four feet long and a foot wide. And I was at the very beginning of my trip uh, in China. And for the next four weeks, I lugged the 60 pound table <laughs> and chair set all around China. I went on Chinese buses and Chinese trains. I wandered around the streets of China with this huge table and chair set. Man, and you really wanted them bad. <laughs> well, I mean, um, yeah, he said, sure, go ahead. You can uh, take them right here and. Uh, here and now. And, That's and awesome. Said, I probably should have had it shipped, but uh, regardless, <laughs> I walked around uh, China for the next four weeks with this uh, table and chair set. I got back to Canada. I placed them for sale on eBay. I think uh, I got them for free. His normal cost was about 40 or $50. Put them on eBay for 200 They sold out within a couple of days. And of course, I reached out to the supplier. I said, hey, can I get some more of these table and chair sets? And he was, he said, of course. And uh Got my next shipment a few weeks later. Same thing kind of happened. Um, they sold out really quick. And fast forward about 10 years later now, and I'm actually still working with the supplier. And currently, I think we import nearly 100 different products from the supplier that I met uh, at the very beginning of my adventure. That is really cool. That's actually an awesome story. Sort of almost sounds like you just stumbled into the whole business, right? I mean, weren't necessarily looking for a specific product or a specific supplier, just sort of happened. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, like I say, it's me and the supplier kind of hit it off and yeah, it, the rest is history, they say. Yeah, absolutely. And so let's go ahead and give people the big picture of, okay, well, you started with nothing, but now your business is doing very well. Can you give us an idea of how well in terms of either revenue or any number you want to share your business is doing right now? So today we're doing just over a million dollars and that's mostly online. I would say we do about 80% of that online, and the other 20 to 25% is either wholesale, various trade shows, and that type of thing. That's kind of grown each year, uh, anywhere from 40 to 50% per year. Wow. So how much time has been from when you first got that first set of table and chairs and sold them on eBay to today? You know, I think it was in 2008 or 2007. Okay. Okay. So it's uh, it's been a few years. Yep. Um, and uh, you've grown it to where it is now. And yeah, man, with, with that much growth potential, 40% or whatever it may be, no, that's great. How many um, people do you have working with you or for you right now? Now we have, uh, there's three of us working um, in our office and we kind of handle the order fulfillment, or not the order fulfillment, the, the order support, customer service, the marketing and that type of thing. And almost all of our fulfillment though, we actually have outsourced to a warehouse that we rent down in Washington State, and they handle all of our orders. So we send, we get our orders in the morning, and we send them off to our warehouse um, 
just south of the border in Washington. Yeah, that's awesome. And and people listening, we have the Washington connection. I'm in <laughs> I'm in Richland, Washington, and so it's kind of cool that we at least share some things in the same state. Uh, very yep. cool. So to give us an idea of where you're selling online, are you doing business strictly on Amazon? And I I know the answer to this, but you know how much is coming on Amazon and how much is coming elsewhere online? Um, Amazon's definitely becoming a bigger and bigger. Uh, Part of the business, uh, when I first started, it was almost all eBay and our website. Um, today, I would say it's kind of evenly split between, in terms of online, in between our website, eBay, and Amazon. Amazon actually has a wholesale division of their company where um, they actually buy products from you and they hold that inventory. And that's actually becoming a bigger and bigger part of our company. Oh, interesting. So a- Amazon's buying that from you and then are they selling it under their own brand? They don't sell it under their own brand. Um, so it's a difference between if you go on Amazon, you'll notice there's obviously an Amazon fulfilled by Amazon mm-hmm. listing and also uh, fulfilled by Amazon and sold by Amazon. So mm-hmm. they're actually, uh, when you see those listings where they actually have the stock and they own it in their warehouse. So that's what's going on with us. Gotcha. Okay. No, very cool. And you kind of mentioned what industry you started in, you know, the first set of products that you sold. Are you still in the same industry? Maybe give us an idea uh, of what an industry that you are selling products in right now. Yep. So um, as I mentioned, uh, the core of our business is boating supplies. Um, and we've kind of branched out into different kind of outdoor recreation areas uh, in that time, uh, RVing, camping, fishing, that type of thing. But uh, definitely boating is still kind of our core uh, core business. No, oh, that's awesome. Very cool. And so definitely feel free to share any examples along the way, specifically about boating products or anything, yeah. if that helps out. But let's go ahead and dive into kind of the meat of what I want to talk about. Um, something that I haven't you know, dug into as well as I probably could have with previous guests and in my own research is sourcing products from China. My current process is I sort of see something that's maybe doing well on Amazon and I go over to Alibaba.com and, you know, that's about it. I send a few emails and if somebody says yes, they can produce it, I get a sample and, and I go for it. But there's so much more that can be done. So let's go ahead and talk about that, deciding on which products to sell and then sourcing those products from China. You know, what are the steps that someone should follow, in your opinion, to pick a new product to sell? So I think if you're looking for a product, uh, the easiest way to kind of find that little niche or industry that you're going to import into, um, if you have kind of a natural hobby or passion that you're already involved in. So like I said, for me, um, my family's always been around boats. So that was kind of a natural entry point for me. Um, I know a lot of people, you know, doing various different things. You know, I had a friend who was a truck driver and he started importing uh, semi-truck wheels. I know another person importing makeup supplies and basically things that they're passionate about. So that's that's kind of the natural one to get into. But more specifically, if you're picking a niche, what I always recommend to people, you want to pick a niche that's a mile wide opposed to a mile deep. So I'll give you an example. Take, for example, marathon running versus mountain climbing. And if you're importing, if you want to get into marathon running products, When it comes to what products you could actually sell to marathon runners, you could sell them running shoes and water bottles, and that's kind of it. But in terms of like mountain climbing, you could sell them ropes, you could sell them harnesses, you could sell them crampons, you could sell them a sleeping bag, you could sell them a ton of different products. And so really when you're picking kind of an area that you're going to import into, pick a niche that has a lot of different possibilities for add-ons and accessories. And why that's important is that once you find a really good supplier who's providing you good quality products at a really good price, chances are that same supplier is going to have dozens, if not hundreds of different products in that niche already. So if you're importing um, crampons from that mountain climbing supplier, they can su- they can probably supply you the ropes, the tents, the sleeping bags and all of that. And it really, uh, really makes your whole uh, your whole process a lot easier. No, that makes sense. And, and good advice on, you know, looking to the future for where you can expand. But Um, What about market research or or what else? You know, certainly being passionate about the product that you want to go into is is great. But how do you know if, well, if I go into mountain climbing equipment, I have any potential whatsoever? Um, If there's all just a bunch of big players, you know, can I break into that? Or what, what should I be looking at in terms of market research? 
I mean, you can go you can go onto eBay and you can search the completed listings. You can go through Terapeak, uh, which is basically a software that has access to all of eBay's completed listings, and you can kind of see what things have sold for. You can go on Amazon and kind of see what's selling. You can see the reviews. The only problem with that is that if somebody's already selling it on eBay or Amazon, um, the chances are if you're just going to go in there and kind of undercut them by a couple of dollars, they're probably going to come back. And as soon as they see you doing that, they're going to do the same thing. So, you know, if there's a lot of competition for a product and if it is selling well, it does seem that once a product does start selling well on eBay or Amazon, uh, within about six months, a lot of people start to get on board. So, I mean, it's one strategy. The strategy I like to take, um, if, I, if I'm if i talking to my supplier and they give me their catalog and I can see the different products they have, I kind of, you kind of develop an eye for it after a while, what you think might sell. And then I try to order as few of that product as possible. So, you know, try to get five or 10 of those products, import them in and just give it a shot on Amazon or eBay. Uh, because if you order just five or 10, I mean, if they don't sell, they don't sell. And if they sell, great. Um, chances are you kind of first to market and you can, you can have quite a bit of time where you can actually sell that and be the only person selling that product. Okay. No, that that's good advice. So I, I am I correct in thinking then that you're not necessarily looking at any specific numbers? You're not look, going over to the Amazon bestseller rank and trying to do any sort of formula there to, you know, look at competition and see what they're selling. But more you're kind of saying, you know what, pick, just try to use your intuition, um, what might work. And then really your testing comes in just ordering super small quantities and testing it live in the market. Yeah. And that really does, uh, that's kind of the gist of it. And okay. What you can do, I mean, if you are going through the Amazon uh, top seller list, and I mean, that's fine to do uh, because you can. You can get a lot of insight and kind of free market research. But I would see what's selling and is there maybe the possibility to sell a product in a different color or a different size? Um, I know for us, uh, for example, our boating supplies, a lot of times um, there's such a wide variation between uh, something for a small boat compared to a big boat. And maybe something, maybe there's a top seller in Amazon, a specific product that's only designed for a small boat. So then I go, okay, well, maybe uh, if we just imported a different size of this for a little bit larger boat, uh, we can kind of have exclusivity on that market for a little bit, and uh, people are probably wanting it. So that's something, I, a little piece of advice I would give people. If you're going through the top seller list, that's fine, but I would try to get a little bit different twist on the top sellers if you can, rather than simply uh, getting the exact copy of it. And that makes sense. And so this is a little bit of a mind shift for, for maybe some listeners. Um, I've talk to other people where they're focusing on just maybe a couple of products, right? And they're trying to just scale those products as much as possible um, to make them that twenty or $30,000 a month. And that's really their main focus. But it kind of sounds like what you've done, and you mentioned earlier that you have, I think you said just over 100 uh, different products, right, um, that, that you're selling, that you're kind of just casting a wide net. And you're okay if maybe one of your products isn't making thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars every month. But if it's profitable, it, it's, you know, that's great, right? I mean, that's definitely the strategy that we take. Yeah, absolutely. It's a little bit wider niche, um, kind of back to that uh, mile, mile wide analogy opposed to a mile deep. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, the 100 products, we there's that, that's just from one supplier. We actually, uh, overall, it works out to about two or 300 different products. Yeah, I mean, uh, the sales for some of those products, you know, we can be lucky if we sell even a few of those a month with uh, quite a few different SKUs, um, uh, even a few sales a month really adds up. So it's definitely two approaches you can take. Mm -hmm. um, my experience has been that people who do kind of import a little bit wider variety of products tend to, their longevity is a little bit longer. Just mm -hmm. if you are selling a lot of product in a month, if you don't have a patent or some kind of IP with it, uh, chances are eventually somebody's gonna come along and kind of sell the same thing. That makes absolute sense. Yep, it's kind of a way to diversify your whole portfolio. You're right. Yeah. I mean, if yeah, maybe one product gets uh, copied or taken over by a competitor, but it's a lot harder to do that with two or three hundred products, yeah. uh, like you said. So very cool. No, a great uh, sort of way to strategically think about things. I think. So let's dive into the nitty gritty here now, if we will. So we we've decided kind of a, a general market that we want to go into now. How do we actually go about finding? a great manufacturer, a great supplier in China. What what are some of your steps for doing that? Well, I mean, there's kind of four different areas that you can look for a supplier. Um, number one, you can go to a trade show kind of like where I began. Um, number two, you can go to sites like Alibaba. 
Number three, you can use a sourcing agent. And number four, you can use uh, you can do competitor research on what your competitors are importing and what suppliers are using. Um, so I don't know how much detail you want to go to go into in either of those things. As far as trade shows are concerned, are there some here in the U.S. that people can actually go to that are worthwhile? You know, it's funny. Um, in terms of trade shows, uh, a lot of the Chinese suppliers are actually they're attending U.S. trade shows more and more often. Um, so it's actually a really good, convenient way um, to kind of look for a supplier. So if you go to an industry trade show, in my example, you go to a boating trade show. A lot of times you will see a Chinese company there or maybe even a few um, that are actually based in China. And they're simply looking for people um, to import their products. Um, so that's a really friction free way to look for a supplier at a trade show. Um, a better way is to actually go to China and uh, visit some trade shows. Obviously, the Canton Fair in Guangzhou, which is twice a year, is um, it's like the World Cup of Chinese suppliers. It's just it's amazing how big it is. Um, so that's the easiest one to go to and definitely the biggest. Uh, but in China, there's literally thousands of trade shows every year in every different little niche. I mean, I've seen uh, I've seen ice cream trade shows in China. There's just a niche, there's a trade show for every little niche uh, imaginable. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. I guess um, maybe taking a step back, I'm just thinking about you know who might be listening to this, and it's probably people just wanting to get started out. What what is sort of the easiest way for somebody that doesn't have the resources to go to China, you know, but yeah. somebody that just getting started out, what's what's maybe the best way for them? The best way is definitely going to be Alibaba, mm -hmm. um, and Alibaba is essentially the eBay of Chinese suppliers. Um, Chinese suppliers list their products for sale up on Alibaba, and basically that's how they connect. Uh, Alibaba connects Chinese suppliers to importers. And if you're using Alibaba, it's a great way. Uh, it's definitely a great way to kind of get your feet wet. Um, the only recommend, a couple of recommendations I would make when using Alibaba. Uh, number one, when you go on Alibaba and you have a product that you want to import, make try to get at least two or three quotes from different suppliers on Alibaba, uh, just to kind of get an idea what a fair price is for a product, because a supplier might you might be asking for hey what's the price on this widget and they might tell you a hundred dollars well you have no idea if that's a good price or a bad price but if you get two or three competing quotes you kind of at least see if they're all in the same ballpark and you can at least pick the very lowest quote there so definitely alibaba is a great way to start like i say just make sure to get two or three quotes on alibaba there's a certain thing called a gold supplier now a gold supplier doesn't really mean that you're going to get great quality products by any means of uh, the imagination, but it does mean that that supplier is probably fairly legitimate, fairly professional, meaning that you're going to pay for your products and you're going to get them fairly quickly. So Alibaba is a great way to kind of get your feet wet. Very good. So yeah, people can check the, the gold suppliers. Anything else? I know there's several other options that people can, can check when sort of filtering out suppliers. Is that sort of the main one that people should be concerned with? Uh, well, when you're on Alibaba, you want to be careful of a couple of things. Um, definitely filter your searches by uh, by country. Alibaba has this Chinese stigma, but they're attracting a lot more uh, international suppliers. So it's pretty common to get um, Indian suppliers on there and Eastern Europe suppliers on there. And that's fine. But if you're kind of going after the Chinese market, definitely make sure that you are searching just for Chinese suppliers. Um, mm -hmm. Kind of stay away from the Hong Kong suppliers. Not that they're necessarily bad, but in those cases, they're generally they're generally trading companies who are going to charge you quite a bit more than actually uh, working with the supplier directly in China. Yep, that makes sense. And out of my own curiosity, I have never worked with a sourcing agent. Um, when might that come in handy? Why Why would somebody use a sourcing agent? Yeah, just any tips you have there. So with a sourcing agent, um, normally you want to use a sourcing agent if you really have a firm idea of what product you want and maybe you just you can't find it anywhere. You go on Alibaba and you cannot find this product or you're really, really, really concerned with quality um, and you want somebody, you know, kind of just ensuring at all times that uh, this quality, that this product's going to be made to outstanding quality. So that's when you'd work with the sourcing agent and a sourcing agent is normally going to take generally about somewhere around a 10 to 30 percent commission on each order that you do. Um, they're going to try to hide uh, what factory they're using. So you don't just in other ways, they won't just help you with the first order and then give you the contact information for those factories. They'll kind of be with with you uh, for every order that you make. So they're going to take that commission on pretty much every single order that you're making. Um, but a sourcing agent, definitely, um, if you have a specific product in mind and you're having a hard time sourcing it or you've invented a product, a sourcing agent is a great, uh, great option. And have you personally used a sourcing agent for any of your products? 
Yeah, one of um, we actually in Vancouver there was a. Uh, you actually find this in a lot of cities with large Chinese populations. Um, a lot of times there's companies uh, that uh, are based in you know America or Canada, uh, but they have a lot of relationships in China. And uh, yeah, one of uh, one of the first suppliers I started working with actually uh, was a friend of a friend and his dad. And uh, long story short, he helped uh, produce kind of this uh, boat anchor, which uh, the patent had just expired. And so no suppliers in China were actually making it at the time. So he really helped uh, kind of to get that product up and off the ground. No, that's very cool. And and this is sort of a slight diversion uh, from what I was going to ask here. But what if you do have an original product idea? You know, maybe you, it's something that you get a patent on, but but maybe not. You know, maybe it's just a slight twist on a product. And uh, as far as you know, nobody currently manufactures this product. So you need to present some sort of original designs. Sounds like maybe that isn't something that you've necessarily done before. I, and maybe correct me if I'm wrong, but how would somebody go about creating a, a unique product? Maybe it's just a slight twist on a product. I mean, what our company has done in the past, um, there'll be products that somebody is selling in the market, which aren't patented. Um, and just there's no actual Chinese suppliers manufacturing that product. So I'll actually send a sample to one of our suppliers and say, hey, uh, do you think we can get this made? And uh, a lot of times, you know, their eyes just widen right up and they go, oh, new product. And uh, they can really help you actually to manufacture that product, normally under the assumption that, OK, um, if you're in America, they'll say, OK, well, I'm not going to sell to any other American customers, but we're going to work together, kind of develop this product. I'll sell to everywhere else and you can sell in America. And so that's one way if uh, you're just trying to copy a product. Now, if you actually have your own product that you've uh, that you've kind of invented and it's completely unique, that's definitely where you want to get in contact uh, with a sourcing agent or some other third party who can actually really help you with every step of the way. Because um, yeah, there are definitely when you comes to the Chinese creating a brand new product, that's where you really do need to hold their hand at every step of the way. There's a lot of uh, a lot of potential for miscommunication and that type of thing. Yeah, absolutely. So where would somebody go to find a sourcing agent? You know, I mean, uh, obviously, Google is your friend in that regard. Um, you can mm -hmm. ask around in your city, but uh, in terms of like a go to place for finding a uh, sourcing agent, I mean, really, you just have to ask around. Uh, you can Google it a little bit. There are uh, there are sourcing agents who kind of specialize in different things, textiles, metal, that type of thing. Um, it's really just uh, you just kind of kind of search around and uh Hopefully you can find someone that uh, has a specialty in the niche that you're looking to develop a product in. Mm -hmm. Any other sort of search queries um, other than, you know, typing in uh, sourcing agent? Is there anything sort of related phrases? Maybe, I, you know, I'm just thinking down yeah. the road, people might want to um, look for somebody to help them with their invention or whatever. Yeah, you um, know, it's um, I'd have to go through. Uh, I have a few pages bookmarked. It's real, like I say, it's not uh, something my company's ever really specialized in um, developing a product uh, completely patented and original. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I, I wouldn't want to give any bad advice there. But no, that's okay. No, that's okay. It's um, again, this is kind of a diversion of what mm -hmm. I was going to ask anyway. So, but but that's good tips I think for people to get started. Let's say that you you've gone on Alibaba, you've got some samples uh, from a manufacturer in China, and you're ready to start talking about uh, price and, and other things. What are some things that people should be negotiating? Um, you know, what should they be trying? What, what can they do to make sure they're getting a good deal? So uh, the first thing, like I say, if you're on Alibaba and you hopefully you've gotten quotes from a few different suppliers, um, you kind of know at that point that you have a more or less fair price. Um, that's not to say that you're not going to be able to get a lower price, but at that point, you know you have, you're not being uh, ripped off completely. So at that point, I don't really like to start negotiating price before I've made uh, at least a real order. So if you're ordering a sample, that's not the right time to start negotiating price because Chinese suppliers, it's kind of a funny thing with them. They're actually really picky with what companies they work with. Um, and it's really common for them actually to stonewall you. Um, so if you start to get uh, negotiate right off the bat, it's possible that they'll just actually stop, repeat, stop answering your emails. Um, Makes sense. Yep. So um, I would what I would do, I always recommend people make that first order, get a few samples in, you know, one, two, and maybe even a dozen samples, get those in. And when you're actually ready, you know, and you say, OK, I can sell maybe 100 of these um, every month or every, every couple of months, then you can negotiate price. That's the point that you should negotiate, uh, start negotiating. But mm -hmm. 
aside from price, there's a few other things that you can negotiate. And the list of things that you can negotiate, price and other things, include freight. You can negotiate minimum order quantities. You can negotiate packaging. You can negotiate delivery time. And you can negotiate payment terms. And the easiest one to negotiate on that list, aside from price, is freight. So rather than actually negotiate price, a lot of times what I'll say to a supplier is, hey, um, can you include the freight to, uh, to Vancouver? And for whatever reason, Chinese suppliers are a lot more open and open to paying $400 in freight rather than actually negotiating $400 in product subsidies or a product discount. So that's the first thing I always uh, tell people to try to negotiate. Uh, ask for free freight. Yeah, interesting. And so um, are you using a – how does that work? Because um, I'm using a shipping agent. Right. Yeah. To pick up my product in at the Shanghai port or wherever. Yeah. So who are you negotiating there with? So um, when you had your product was um, I know I've uh, read some of your blog, uh, mm-hmm. your podcast. Uh, I guess your last one was sea freight, correct? Correct. Yep. And so did you arrange the sea freight all on your own there? Um, your supplier really didn't have. Um, any say in that? Uh, c- correct, for the most part. Um, m- my shipping agent handled most of that. Um, basically, su- supplier got it to the port yep. in, in Shanghai, and then my shipping company picked it up from there, got it on the boat, and uh, yeah, brought it here to the U.S. and into their warehouse. So you can do it one of two ways. You can do it your way, and you've arranged for all the freight on your end. Um, whether your supplier is going to pay for freight or not, you can simply ask for him to arrange the freight. And either hopefully he gives you free freight, and then you don't have to even worry about paying anything. But you can just simply ask him to arrange for the freight and bill you for it. So that's one way to do it. And obviously, if he's agreed to yeah, give free freight, then he's actually going to arrange through his freight forwarder to have everything shipped to uh, your city. And it's uh, uh, freight forwarders in China, they have connections to every city uh, in the world. So having something shipped with their freight forwarder in China to your city is no problem. So basically, yeah, just gotcha. use that. They arrange everything. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, I, I want to dive into getting lower minimum order quantities. You mentioned that earlier. You just mentioned that again. What's what's sort of the trick there to get lower minimum order quantities than maybe they're advertising on Alibaba? Yeah, and that's always going to be the biggest challenge um, when importing from China is kind of dealing with those minimum order quantities because you can go on Alibaba and you'll notice these absurd minimum order quantities. And they might have a minimum order quantity of 10,000 tennis rackets. Well, who can sell 10,000 tennis rackets? So kind of uh, kind of dealing with those minimum order quantities, it's always a challenge. But there's a few different ways that you can deal with minimum order quantities. Um, so first off, you can simply ask to pay a higher price or maybe a small surcharge for it. Second, you can ask to have your product produced with another customer's order. Or number three, just simply build a relationship with a supplier. And over time, if you've dealt with a, sp- with a supplier for one or two years, they're going to be more open to lower minimum order quantities opposed to your first order, where they're going to be kind of going to be kind of hard set in that minimum minimum order quantity. So, and kind of getting back to that point one, where you can ask to pay a higher cost. Um, to give you an example, I actually just made an order with one of our suppliers uh, on Monday for a particular uh, motorhome accessory. And this motorhome accessory is about $100, um, and I only wanted to order 20 of these, but the supplier said, uh, you got to order 50. And basically, we came to an agreement, okay, you can buy 20 of them, Dave, but you're going to have to pay $3 more per unit. And of course, I jumped all over that. Um, the idea of having 20 of these accessories, which I... Is only going to take me a couple months to sell, opposed to having to buy 50 of them, which could take even longer to sell. It's going to tie up my cash. I'd be much more happy to pay that little surcharge. And and that makes sense. So a lot of it probably does come down to building up a relationship. And over time, certainly if you're dealing with the same one or two suppliers, you're going to be able to get a lot more flexibility in what you're able to negotiate. I would assume that makes sense. Yep, absolutely. In China, it always comes down to the the relationship. So. Definitely after a year of working with the supplier, you get a lot more flexibility and a lot more priority. Yeah, and I assume it's somewhat similar in delivery time as well, negotiating that. I mean, maybe it's something that just over time you're able to get them to prioritize your order or any additional tips for delivery time there. Yeah, and again, this is one of the other things. Uh, uh, one of the biggest challenges with importing is delivery times. Every single yeah. Chinese supplier in the world is going to say, we're going to deliver it in 30 days or we're going to finish producing it in 30 days. 
rarely does it ever happen that way. And I think you kind of went through the same thing, uh, Spencer, if I, if I remember correctly. You do remember correctly, yes. <laughs> <laughs> there were some hitches along the way. It took a little longer. Yes, and and those hitches always come up. Um, there always <laughs> seems to be something. So it's always a challenge. I definitely do not take your supplier's word for it. A good little tip what you can do to kind of get your order finished as quickly as possible, put a penalty in the contract that says, okay, you complete it in 30 days. If it's a week late, there's a 1% penalty. Two weeks is a 2% penalty. And after three weeks late, the order order is just canceled. And the supplier, you know, you're never probably going to enforce that penalty, but at least it says to the supplier, okay, well, Dave has this in his contract, but Spencer doesn't have it in his. Even though Spencer ordered before, we're going to finish Dave's just a little bit quicker. Yeah. So, <laughs> It was you, Dave. You made it slower. No, no, that makes sense. That's that. That's a good tip. Yep. No, makes absolute sense. And so as, as far as, um, I mean, it just seems like once you're able to establish a relationship with a supplier and then how you mentioned if you ask for their catalog, is this something that you do? Basically, you get their catalog and then say, hey, why don't you tell me what your best-selling products are? And maybe you'll just start selling those best-selling products. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, that's one thing to keep in mind with your Chinese suppliers. They're a little bit, when you're emailing them on Alibaba, don't just simply ask for their catalog. For whatever reason, they're really paranoid about giving out a full catalog and a, and a full price list. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of it is they're worried about their competition, kind of uh, seeing what they're selling and for how much. Um, so, you know, kind of warm them up to that, to asking for their full catalog. But, you know, once you've made that sample order and you've proven that you're kind of a serious buyer, definitely ask for the catalog and, yeah, ask them what their top selling products are. And they're happy to share it to you. Um, and that's a great way to kind of get free uh, free competitor research. Yeah, absolutely. And then the, the, the sort of final thing as far as ordering is concerned is, is payment terms. Maybe give us an idea of what a standard payment term is, you know, from first order, you know, maybe a sample order, a very small sort of minimum order might be a little bit different payment terms than sort of once you've been established for a little while, done a few orders, you know, is uh, how much is paid up front and when the order's done, that sort of thing. Yep. Um, so with your first order on Alibaba um, or wherever you're making it, if it's under about $1,000, they're normally going to expect you to pay for everything up front. And a lot of times they'll be happy, you know, to have you pay with PayPal. They'll charge you a small surcharge, probably 4 or 5%, and that's fine. And so they're going to want you to pay for everything up front. After that, when you get into a little bit larger orders, normally common payment terms are 30% when you make the order and then 70% when the order is complete. And you'll notice kind of uh, whenever you're paying now in China, you're going to have to pay up front, which is it's a little bit scary, especially for uh, people who have never imported from China before. I think there's always that fear that the guy across uh, the computer from you is going to take that money and run. So don't worry about that too much if you're importing from China, especially if you found a gold supplier in Alibaba. The chances of, take, chances of them taking your money is pretty slim. So don't really worry about that. Definitely low quality products is a bigger concern. But in terms of them taking your money, that's pretty rare. So yeah, 30 percent up front and then 70 percent when the product's actually ready to ship is pretty common. Yep. And uh, yeah, that, that, that sounds about right. And, and certainly uh, they all prefer, of course, wire transfer for any yeah. bigger order. And that's, that's just pretty standard, um, I think, as well. You know, we've gone through all this. We've negotiated price and delivery time. Is there ever a question between shipping via sea versus air freight? And what are kind of those determining factors? I mean, I certainly know for my product, it's, it's a larger product. Um, air freight is just way too expensive. It cuts into my margins way too much at this point. So sea freight just makes a lot more sense. But when when does air freight make sense? Yeah. So um, with sea freight versus air freight, I mean, uh, the big difference between the two, obviously, aside from price, is the fact that air freight you're going to get within a week or two. Sea freight, you know, from the time it leaves the factory to the time it gets to you, it's probably going to be anywhere from a month to six weeks. So it's quite a long time. So that's obviously the big problem with sea freight, but it's cheap normally. Uh, so kind of the general rule of thumb is that anything over three or 400 pounds, you want to have shipped via sea freight. Anything under that, you want to have shipped via air freight. And kind of the average rates per pound or per kilogram, it's normally about 10 times more expensive for air freight. Now, you would say, well, can I just cheap out and just have everything shipped sea freight all the time? 
But the problem with sea freight is that when it actually gets to your home country, you're going to pay anywhere from $500 to $1,500 in various different fees. So you're going to have to pay for a customs broker. You're going to have to pay for dock fees. You're going to actually have to pay to get the product picked up from the port and delivered to your place. Um, and overall, these kind of work out to about $500 to $1,500 minimum kind of fixed costs for a sea freight shipment. Um, so there does become a point, obviously, where air freight, which doesn't really have those added fees. So when you if you pay $200 to have something shipped from Shanghai to uh, to Seattle, that's kind of what you're paying. There's really no surprise fees. But with, with sea freight, there is a lot of surprise fees. So general rule of thumb is that anything over three or 400 pounds, you want to have uh, shipped via sea freight. And one of the things I've actually on on my website, ChineseImporting.com, for people, what I put together is a little uh, Excel spreadsheet, which you enter in your product, the rough uh, weight of each product, and it kind of gives you a guideline for whether you should be having it shipped via sea freight or air freight and a good approximation of what um, – what the fees you're going to pay are. And uh, after the show, Spencer, I can give that link to you and maybe you can link up to it in the show notes. Yeah, no, that would be great. I can absolutely do that. Um, okay, now shifting gears just slightly um, and it's something that I honestly don't think I've brought up at all on the podcast previously is legal concerns. You know, what legal concerns should, pe- should people be thinking about when they're importing products from China? Yeah, so... The biggest thing with when you're importing from China, that one thing you always want to be careful about is number one, just making sure that obviously you can get the the product into your country without requiring uh, special permits and paperwork. And number two, of course, making sure that nobody gets hurt um, using the product. And China does have a little bit of a reputation for having some poor quality products. So a good general rule of thumb is. If there's a high chance of somebody getting hurt with your product, you know, maybe look to a different product, especially if you're kind of first starting off. So any inherently dangerous product, stay away from it. You know, something like a table and chair set. I mean, there's not really a lot that can go wrong in a table and chair set. Um, chance of somebody dying from it is pretty low, opposed to, uh, you know, something like, say, a trampoline, where somebody could easily really get hurt uh, with just a small, with a small little malfunction in the product. Um, there's a lot of potential there for harm. So, and there's a few categories which are kind of red or red flags when you're importing from China. Number one, like I say, inherently dangerous products, you know, things where there's a potential for somebody to get hurt. Children's products, anything that has to do with a kid that a kid may potentially use, uh, aside from the fact that you could really hurt somebody, there's often a lot of, uh, a lot of red tape that goes with that and you need certain regulations. Um, Something as simple as like a shirt for a child, it may require a lot of uh, third-party testing to make sure that that shirt's not flammable. It doesn't contain um, any types of dyes that might hurt the child, Um, so that type of thing. So really uh, be careful of things for kids and things that are inherently dangerous. And obviously uh, anything that you digest digest into your body, food, vitamins, drinks, that type of thing, uh, a lot of bureaucracy involved with it to actually even be able to import it into your home country. So how do people go about checking to see if the the products they're thinking about importing have any special regulations or requirements? So again, Google is obviously your friend. Um, <laughs> yep. you, can, you can Google the product category. Another thing you can do if you're working with a customs broker, so when you bring your products into the country, you can pay for all the duties yourself. Uh, it's a little bit of work. Or you can work with somebody called a customs broker who basically uh, they charge about $100 and they'll uh, basically do all the paperwork for you. And so those people are great at you know eliminating the time that it takes you to pay for duties, but they, they're a wealth of information for this type of thing. And you can simply say, hey, um, I'm going to import this product into America. Are there any regulations I should be aware of? And normally they'll tell you uh, free of charge instantly whether you know, it needs certain certifications. So that's a definitely a good place to start. And like I say, if your product falls into that children category or anything that you're digesting – chances are there's probably going to be some additional paperwork that you're going to need. That makes sense. So um, beyond that, and, and that's those are all very good tips, actually. B- beyond that, as far as legal concerns, I mean, is, is this business, you know, just in general, um, importing products from China, is this something that we should be talking to our own individual attorneys about and, and making sure we have all our ducks in a row? Or Generally speaking, if we kind of do our own due diligence as far as, you know, we know this product is safe and we know there's no special regulations, that sort of thing, we're okay. I mean, the 
most people don't do any due diligence before, um, and <laughs> right, and they do fine. I know when I first started off, um, I didn't do any due diligence. Um, that's not to say it's the best way to go, uh, but a lot of people do it. My advice, I mean, if there's not a huge potential for your product to really hurt somebody. If you're importing something, like I say, like a backpack or a uh, or a dog leash or you know just some random product where really nobody's going to get hurt. Uh, I mean, there's not a lot of you can go through, you can talk to your attorney, you can talk to your accountant and everything, but really more or less, I think it's important, you know, just try to get that first order of, you know, 10 products or something, get them into your country, worry about the legal stuff after, you know, once you actually have traction, um, then you can kind of start to worry about taxation and all this and that. Um, but importing overall, it's a really bit, really easy business actually to get off and running uh, pretty quickly and cheaply. Yeah. I, it doesn't sound easy. You know, I can tell you that when I started looking into this, I mean, it just seems so complicated, you know, getting things from China to here and finding a manufacturer. But but you're right. Once, you know, and I've only been looking into this for a few months, really. Now that I'm sort of doing this and I've had a couple of shipments come over and I'm selling on Amazon, it really isn't that complicated. Um, it's just because it's new that it seems so complicated to people, I think. Well, um, I, I know for me, the first time uh, I actually imported a sea shipment, uh, I, I was almost in tears because I was wondering, what are all these different forms that I need? And <laughs> really, after the first time, though, it's a, it's really pretty easy. Right. Yep. Once you jump through the hoops, you know what to expect the next time. You're right. It gets a little bit easier. So beyond just strictly uh, legal requirements, because I did want to talk about that, um, what about sort of product liability um, You know, insurance? Is it, for whatever reason, let's say somebody does, I don't know, fall off the table and chairs that you had and they they want to sue you because the, the, the chair broke or whatever, is, is there any kind of insurance that, people should have with this business i mean product liability insurance is always a good thing to have um the problem is product liability insurance is not uh is not cheap so and i would say the vast majority of people selling on amazon and ebay um have never even considered liability insurance again it's one of those things where you really have to take into you kind of have to assess yourself okay is there any potential for somebody to get harmed um, with this product. If there's potential for them to get harmed, I mean, I might look to a different product uh, overall. And if, and if you really are dead set on it, definitely um, that's probably something you should look into. Uh, but like you said, with that being said, uh, the vast majority of people, quote unquote, self-insure. And if so, you know, if the potential for harm is more property harm than personal injury. Um, you know, liability insurance, it's for better or worse for a lot of people, it's more of an optional thing than a, uh, than a requirement. Okay. Yeah. No, and that makes sense. Okay. So again, shifting gears here just a little bit, you know, I'm, I'm on, I'm talking about, okay, here's my revenue and here's my potential profit. I'm, you know, calculating my manufacturing costs and my shipping costs and everything else. How do, how do you go about calculating your potential profit margin? So when you're sourcing a new product, um, what are kind of the numbers you run through to figure out if this has, you know, big enough margins that make you interested to go after? Well, I mean, today what I try to go, I try to, at the very minimum, hope that I can sell the product for three times whatever I paid for it. And uh, the reason for that, I mean, most importantly, kind of we live in a free shipping world today. So anything you sell on Amazon or eBay or online, you're going to be expected to pay for the shipping on it. So, I mean, once you calculate just the shipping cost with UPS or FedEx, uh, that's going to eat into a big chunk of your margin. So there used to be an old rule that you know you want to sell for at least double what you paid for it. Well, that might be true if you don't have to pay for shipping, but because you're going to have to pay for shipping uh, to get that product from you to your customer, uh, wherever they may be, definitely three times is a good uh, is a good rule of thumb to go by. And so, so that's is that three times your your base manufacturing cost? Yeah. So if I was okay. importing. I was importing something for $100, I would hope to be able to sell it with free shipping minimum for $300. Okay. And and that makes sense. Um, so that, that's a good rule of thumb. I mean, what what sort of um, amount are you usually contributing to shipping and, and all those other fees, right? So you've got a third is going to be a, your manufacturing costs. And then, I don't know, is another third your shipping and other fees? And then maybe a third profit, something like that? Yeah, I mean a third profit. Uh, that's it's after you take into account everything. I mean, 
if you're around that 30% net margin, that's pretty good um, because there are a lot of extra costs. Um, you obviously, you have the shipping costs. Once, if you're selling in America, the shipping costs in America to your customer is a huge chunk of it. And then also, of course, the shipping costs in getting it from China to wherever you are. That's China to America. So that's another big cost. So yeah, I mean, overall, you know, you're, if you sell it for three times as much, Somewhere in that 20 to 30 percent range, it does seem to kind of be that's what you're going to walk away with um, after the smoke clears. So, like I said, if I buy something for $100, sell it for $300, I'm generally kind of happy if, you know, I walk away with $100. Actually, I shouldn't say pretty happy. I'd be over the moon. And it's normally kind of you're aiming for that 20 to 30 percent uh, net margin after you paid for everything, um, including Amazon fees, because when you sell on Amazon, obviously you're going to pay 15 percent uh, commission. Plus, if you're using FBA, there's a cost of getting it from you to an Amazon FBA warehouse. Mm -hmm. Yep. And uh, so sort of final question here, again, sort of finance related, I guess, is just funding the business and, and reinvesting profits. I mean, I'm finding that this this is a very capital intensive business, <laughs> certainly if you want to grow it. Right. I mean, um, yeah. it's it once you get. um you know, you, you invest a lot in manufacturing and shipping, and even after you sell the product, certainly with Amazon, it's not until 30 days later that I actually get paid, right? And so, I, I don't know. Let's maybe just discuss that kind of open-ended. I mean, what's what's your tips for kind of funding and, and yeah. growing the business and just thoughts surrounding that? Yeah, it's uh, it's definitely, uh, again, one of the challenges with importing is it, it can be a bit of a money suck, um, right. especially compared to some of the other things out there, uh, especially compared to something like, say, a drop shipping model. Um, so, yeah, you do need um, you do need money, obviously, to buy the inventory. And it's it's something a lot of retailers, uh, no matter how uh, how they're getting the product, whether it be domestically or from China, are always struggling with. Um, so a couple of things you can do. Um, Number one, obviously, you can bootstrap, uh, just take the profits that you make, reinvest them, reinvest them, reinvest them. Um, hopefully, at some point, you can take the money out. Um, second, as you kind of over time, as you're importing bigger and bigger orders, you can ask for credit from your suppliers in China. Not a lot of people are aware of this, but the Chinese are actually pretty open to the idea of giving credit to uh, foreign companies. So with our two biggest suppliers right now, we basically say, okay, when the product's done and you ship it, we'll give you 50%. And then 30 days later, we'll give you the other 50%. So it gives you free credit um, yeah. pretty much. Mm -hmm. So it's one way to do it. Um, and other than that, I mean, yeah, it's uh, it's always a bit of a challenge. And you bootstrapping um, and friends and family are great ways to try to get that money. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So, I mean, just just basically, I guess, to make people aware, right? I mean, it, it is a capital intensive business. It's not something that just because you might have $5,000 in revenue every month, it doesn't mean that, you know, certainly you're not pulling that off as profit. And if you want to grow the business, it just takes lots. You might have to get whether that's, um, you know, if you have any money, you can you can bootstrap that, you can do financing um, or just, you know, um, generic debt financing. Right. So so there, that is something to just be aware of for people that if they want to at least grow the business and go into different products, um, it it just takes capital. And and one of the biggest things you can do, too, is kind of finding that sweet spot for how much inventory you're you should be holding. So, I mean, if you sell a thousand dollars worth of product per month and you import 12 months worth of product, you know, you need $12,000 uh, to buy that inventory. Or if you know, you import something every month, a thousand dollars each time, then theoretically you need a thousand dollars. Um, so definitely the less inventory that you can hold, the better. But, uh, again, one of the things, uh, that's always, uh, again, another one of those challenges is making sure that you always have product in stock. So it's, I think every importer's dream to con just kind of have that just in time inventory where, you know, you, the second you sell out of your inventory, another shipment's on its way and, uh, you have it right there for you and you, you're not holding a year or two worth of inventory. So that's one of the, one of the other things you always have to be aware of is how much inventory you are holding. Yes, absolutely. And I'm, I'm finding that that is just a learning process, <laughs> I guess, because, um, it's hard to predict how many sales you're going to get yeah. every month. And especially with a new product like myself, I, 
really only been selling for a couple of months. And so I'm starting now to figure out, okay, this is my inventory velocity as far as, you know, how much I'm going to turn over this inventory and yeah. can hopefully do a little bit better job and not be out of, out of stock for a month or whatever. Well, I, I think everybody's worried, you know, bringing in that huge shipment that's doing well. And then all of a sudden the sales just drop right off. And yeah. Let's hope that doesn't happen. <laughs> it really does. But I think everybody is always <laughs> concerned with that. So, I mean, yeah. No, absolutely. So just to kind of wrap things up, there's there's so much more to this business. We didn't even touch on how to actually sell the product, really, you know, to go into marketing and selling it on your website. I've, I've covered a lot of that in previous uh, podcast episodes. But as far as sourcing products and picking the right product, is there anything that you feel like we should have covered that we didn't cover already? Yeah, you know, I, I don't think I don't think it's too much to add. I would, the only encouragement I would give to listeners is definitely go out there, just try to get your first small shipment in. You don't need a lot of money. You can do it with a few hundred bucks. Get that first shipment in. Just give it a try. Selling on Amazon, selling it on eBay, selling it on Craigslist, wherever it might be. Just get that first shipment in. Give it a try, and I'm sure um, chances are you're gonna you're gonna be thrilled with the results that you get. So just get it up and running. Yep, absolutely. I agree. I, that's such a huge thing for so many people is just taking that first actual step beyond listening to podcasts and you know reading blog posts is actually pulling the trigger and getting that first product in. So I agree. Just just kind of people taking that first step is huge. Is there any place other than ChineseImporting.com where you'd like to send people or, or mention? Yeah, ChineseImporting.com is the website I run. It's basically aimed at helping importers kind of get that first order and helping you with the steps along the way after you do get that first order. I also have a, an ebook available on Amazon or ChineseImporting.com. It's called Importing from China is Easy, How to Make a Million Dollars a Year. And like I say, you can get that on ChineseImporting.com or through your Kindle. Excellent. Yeah, people should definitely go check that out. I've actually gone through the ebook myself. There's a lot of great tips, a lot of the things that we did cover here, but a lot of other things that we didn't have time to cover as well. So definitely people should check that out over at ChineseImporting.com. Uh, but David, I appreciate your time so much for coming on the podcast and sharing a lot of your expertise with us. Uh, it's been a lot of fun. Yeah, thank you for having me. Absolutely. And everybody out there, just best of luck in your business.